religious minorities often do not have any meaningful rights. So uh, right, the, the absence of rights severely represses religious life and expression. It is widely believed that the religious values uh, don't fit the public sphere and they are to be limited to the private lives of those who believe in them. However, this solution turned by itself to be a new source of problems when the exclusion of religion from the public sphere was forcefully held against the will of people in some societies. Different religions have followed different historical paths. And so um, the way that people in Lincoln, Nebraska or Washington DC or Berlin uh, think about religion may not be the same as the way somebody in Karachi Pakistan or Cairo, Egypt thinks about religion. And part of the reason for that is the different histories of those parts of the world. Much of the way that people in uh, the Western world or the developed world think about religion is informed by the Enlightenment, um, a European intellectual movement, one consequence of which was a, a large uh, move towards privatizing religion, making it less something that belongs in the public domain and something that more belongs in the private domain. And many people who live in the Western world have that general understanding of religion, that that is where religion belongs. More in, the, um, in people's homes, in people's private lives, than in places like the parliament or the courts of law, and so on and so forth. Um, but in other parts of the world, that didn't have that experience of enlightenment, that move was not made in the same way. So whereas it might seem natural or normal or appropriate to uh, people living here, say, to have a separation of church and state or something like that, uh, people living in uh, other parts of the world may not have that same understanding. With respect to human rights in particular, I think religion can be and has been a very positive force for human rights. We have seen people of all religions, whether they're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Baha'i or Hindu or Buddhist, arise to really be at the forefront of the international human rights movement. You know, they've taken on causes like freedom of religion or belief, obviously, but also the rights of the poor, economic and social rights. So I think we've seen that very positive influence. On the other hand, we've also seen really a negative impact uh, when religion becomes a source of division, a reason to view others as less worthy than yourself or not having access to the same truth that you have access to, then it can become a cause of social divisions. It can obviously become even a cause of war, and we see this in many places around the world. Religion has been used misused and abused by many leaders to accomplish their goals, whether is it just or unjust, whether it is noble, wicked and selfish, or even evil. Good evening. Uh, I am Professor Lloyd Ambrosius. Uh, it is my uh, privilege uh, as chair of the program committee uh, to welcome you to the E.N. Thompson Forum on World Issues. Uh, founded by and later uh, named uh, the E.N. Thompson Forum uh, because of the role that uh, Jack Thompson played, uh, this uh, forum uh, has been designed uh, to uh, bring important issues to the attention of uh, the University of Nebraska community and the uh, larger community uh, throughout uh, Nebraska, uh, dealing with issues of importance throughout the world. We are grateful to the Thompson family and the Cooper Foundation for their generous support uh, for this lecture uh, series. Uh, we're also uh, grateful uh, to the uh, LEAD Center, uh, Nebraska Educational Communi Telecommunications, uh, Cable Channel 21, 
uh, KRNU Radio, uh, and the University Bookstore for their support. This evening's lecture, Protecting the Human Rights of Religious Minorities Worldwide, subtitled International Religious Freedom in U.S. Policy by Felice Gare, is co-sponsored by the Dorothy and Meyer Kripke Fund of the Norman and Bernice Harris Center for Judaic Studies. We are very grateful to its director, Jean Cahan, uh, for this partnership this evening. Felice Gare uh, is the director of the American Jewish Committee's Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights. She is also the chair of the Leo Nevis Task Force on Human Rights of the United Nations Association of the USA and vice chair of the UN Committee Against Torture. Uh, she has served on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, including three terms as its chair. The author of over 40 articles on international human rights, she will share her extensive experience and knowledge uh, with us tonight. After the lecture, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speaker by writing them on cards provided by the ushers. Now join me in welcoming uh, Felice Gare uh, to Nebraska. Good evening and thank you. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Jean Kahan and the Harris Center for Judaic Studies, Lloyd Ambrosius, and the members of the program committee of the E.N. Thompson Forum, and Katie Cervantes, who made all the arrangements for enabling me to join you today, and to thank each of you for coming. This year's theme, Religion, Rights, and Politics, offers an opportunity for the forum to do what it does best, and what it's been doing since its formation just about 25 years ago, to address some of the most complicated and controversial issues of the day. Over the centuries, differences of religion and identity have been a source of tension, conflict, and war, often fought in the name of spreading religious truth. Conquered and oppressed populations have often been denied freedom of religion and have suffered religious persecution. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, told us the following, and I quote, he said, true faith elicits respect, while fanaticism breeds hatred. The problem, Mr. Annan said, is not faith. The problem too often is the faithful. Now, note that Annan emphasizes the role of the individual person and it's my thesis tonight that when addressing religious minorities, we need to keep our focus on the human rights of each individual. It's by valuing and respecting the individual and fighting for each such person's rights that we'll be able to look past ideology, past nationality, past race, and yes, past religion, and work to bring equality and liberty for all. Today, we're seeing a rise in violent incidents against members of religious minorities worldwide. And they are reported to us ever more quickly through the spread of mobile phone and internet technology. Every day in newspapers, television, and electronic media, we read of violence directed against members of one or another religious minority. In the past week alone, I've heard of the following uh, developments. 400,000 people, have fled from the north of Mali in Africa to avoid torture, summary executions, and sexual violence against women at the hand of, of fundamentalist militants. French forces have intervened to protect people from more abuse. In Burma, hopeful reforms seem to have been slowed by the ongoing violence against minorities of different religions. The Muslim Rohingya, and the conflict in Kachin state, where many ethnic Kachin are Christians and churches have been targeted. 
We hear that the government officials there are changing course, but the army apparently is not listening to the government officials. Again, this week, China has renewed persecution against Tibetan Buddhists, at least 100 of whom have self-immolated in recent times as a form of personal protest. 100. Iran has imprisoned members of Christian and Baha'i faiths, including the entire leadership of the Baha'i faith and its teachers working uh, to educate people who are not allowed to be in universities. Shia Muslims have been attacked during religious processions in Pakistan. And other Shias were forcibly evicted from their homes in Indonesia. And just last week, Jews were warned in Scandinavian countries not to wear visible head coverings or other symbols on the streets lest they would be subject to what is reported to be a growing number of increasingly violent attacks in Sweden, Norway, and other advanced democracies. Now, what can or should be done about these types of incidents? In my talk this evening, I plan to discuss several ways to address these issues, and I'll elaborate uh, with particular uh, policy directions. But let me summarize. We need to remember, first of all, that it's the creed, it's the, it's the deed, not the creed, that should be the focus of our attention. We should focus on actions, deeds, that are abusive and criminal and respond to them. Second, when these acts take place, it's not just hooliganism, it's human rights abuse, and we need to take them seriously. Third, impunity can exacerbate violence and empower perpetrators. So don't forget about it and hope it will go away, fix it. And this means work at it. Fourth, it's essential to build institutions and enable them to work. These institutions need to be flexible based on the issue and flexible with the times. They need to find ways to uphold universal norms and values and international human rights. Fifth, advocacy to protect members of religious minorities should combine universalism, particularism, and realism. I'll offer some specific suggestions as well about US policy. Now, Mr. Ambrosius is a historian, and history offers us some perspectives about protecting religious minorities. Over the years, individual rulers have often demanded the final say on defining the religion of all of their sus subjects and the treatment of any minorities that hold a different perspective. If the subjects did not adhere to the ruler's faith, persecution often followed. Entire communities of people have been targeted. Some communities are simply evicted from the conquered lands. Others were traded across the borders. In some areas, governments in one region were allowed to function as the protectors of religious minorities now located under the jurisdiction of another government who happened to have a different religion. Consider in this context the history of anti-Semitism, which can be summed up in three stages, forced conversion, forced expulsion, and genocide. Now these abuses have progressed as follows. First, you cannot live among us as Jews. This approach led to forced conversions. Second, you cannot live among us. This resulted in mass deportations and exile. And finally, the third stage I spoke about, you cannot live. This was realized through Nazi policies of dehumanization, discrimination, and genocide during the Holocaust. In the early 19th and 20th centuries, special treaties were signed to protect such persecuted religious communities. The violent or discriminatory treatment of people sometimes became a reason for intervention of one state in the affairs of another. Non-discrimination treaties were tried, but they had no enforcement mechanisms. Pro-minority treaties such as the 
uh, Treaty of Berlin guaranteed non-discrimination of religious minorities and freedom of worship to all persons who lived in a particular territory. But unfortunately, to skip forward, these were ineffective. After World War I, minority treaties guaranteed minorities in several East European states would be protected. But they focused only on some minorities. The Polish treaty focused on the Poles. The Lausanne treaty focused on the uh, Greeks, Turks, Armenians, and Jews. And they were guaranteed by the League of Nations, but were not challengeable by individuals or before national courts. Recognition of the failed efforts of the League of Nations regarding minority treaties made it an even greater priority to guarantee human rights, including freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, not just to some people, but to every individual. The United Nations Charter, which was adopted in 1945, prohibited discrimination on grounds of religion. Universal human rights protections of freedom of religion were introduced in the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and the world endorsed this concept. Until then, the status and treatment of religious communities was largely bartered and battered among state actors in order to advance stability. The Universal Declaration, affirming the right to belief and the right to manifest that belief in worship, in teaching, in practice and observance, changed this. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty uh, uh, which more than 160 nations have uh, ratified, uh, also protects religious freedom in Article 18. And in its Article 27, it provides that religious minorities cannot be denied their rights to language, culture, and religion. A 1981 declaration set forth other aspects of this right, uh, including to wear religious garb, to import prayer books, to communicate with co-religionists abroad. Now, the concept of freedom of religion has stemmed from certain basic principles, including a belief in the dignity and the sacredness of the human person, and also the importance of religion to the identity of the individual person. These were accompanied by growing respect for the concept of equality and for a, a respect for an acceptance uh, of the idea that tolerance of different religious beliefs also promotes a more just and non-discriminatory society, not merely a conflict-free one. Now, some commentators argue that freedom of religion is important because it's a natural right and it's foundational. Author Michael Novak, when he was serving as a representative of the United States uh, at the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, said, the United States of America, this is a quote, the United States of America recognizes that all human rights began in freedom of thought, conscience, religion, and belief. Others, such as philosopher James Nickell, claim that the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion itself is not essential to the enjoyment of other rights, such as due process of law or freedom of association. Nickel says the case for religious freedom has to stand on the importance of religious freedom itself. And it is vitally important in itself because it shapes the human identity, because it's centrally important to the individual's personality. Now, Human rights instruments have said that freedom of religion cannot be suspended, even in time of national emergency, because it is so fundamental and basic. The first UN expert to write on this subject, Indian, uh, uh, from India, uh, named Arkat Krishnaswamy, said uh, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion is probably the most precious of all human rights and one of the most potent and contagious political forces the world has ever known. This pragmatic argument uh, contends that religious beliefs and the right to worship freely in accordance with those beliefs are key to the individual's identity and that allowing coercive measures to enforce somebody else's religion and decision about your own religion is just unacceptable. 
Now, recent studies reveal that societies that have established religious tolerance and built legal protections for it have prospered economically and in other ways. Protection of freedom of religion has shown to be effective in helping unpopular religious minorities avoid persecution and harassment as well. Now, it's my view that institutional in innovations are needed to address religious freedom and to ensure its importance in fact and in policy. I mentioned some treaties that had been established to protect these rights, and they are monitored by treaty bodies uh, that um, uh, monitor what the governments do in turn. Sometimes national laws also protect these rights. Now, just last Thursday, outgoing Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton reminded us not only about the importance of international institutions and an international architecture that could deal with the complex problems of our times, but also about the need to develop new kinds of international institutions, ones that could conform to the complex challenges uh, we face. She said, and I quote, we need a new architecture for this new world, more Frank Gehry than formal Greek. Now, she was explaining that international organizations need new approaches. And some of these need to take place outside the UN. No doubt she was referring to the Istanbul process being developed uh, from the Human Rights Council, dealing with negative stereotyping and incitement to violence which focuses on actions and leadership that, lead, that, that uh, state officials can take one by one. This was one of her priority projects. Now, earlier, with the adoption of the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, the United States began to explore a broader architecture in the area of national and global institutions to address freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Yet this relatively new architecture has barely been used in the late 1990s, as human rights advocacy expanded and new institutions were in fact created to implement and enforce rights, from international criminal courts to a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, some Americans began to complain about being left out of the growing human rights agenda. They had received reports of increased religious persecution of Christians throughout the world, and they asked why the US State Department and its Human Rights Bureau we're not more concerned about protecting individuals targeted and persecuted for their religious affiliations. In response, the US Congress enacted the International Religious Freedom Act, which is the only such national law creating a range of officials and institutions and a set of requirements to identify and penalize gross violators of religious freedom. They expanded it so that it covers all religions and uh, they created a new architecture uh, which has four parts. Uh, the first part, the act demands a special annual report to the Congress from the executive branch on religious freedom conditions in all countries on which subsequent policy is to be based. Last year's report covered 199 countries or entities. Secondly, the act established an office within the State Department called the Office of International Religious Freedom, and the position of ambassador at large for religious freedom, who is to serve as the principal advisor to the Secretary of State, as well as to the President. Third element in this architecture, the legislation requires an annual review to designate the worst countries, the systematic violators, who are in this act called countries of particular concern. And they are charged with identifying the foreign agency, the specific officials responsible for the severe violations of religious freedom overseas. Now, the International Religious Freedom Act outlines 15 different actions that can be taken with regard to violator countries, beginning with a private diplomatic demarche, postponing a cultural exchange, canceling a state visit. But for severe violations, the United States could deny economic and military aid or more. And it does. The fourth part of this law created a nine-member independent bipartisan oversight body called the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. 
It's made up of nine private citizens, appointed three by the president, three by the House of Representatives, and three by the Senate. Their primary responsibilities are to review the facts and circumstances of violations every year, and to make policy recommendations to the President, Secretary of State, and Congress on matters involving international religious freedom. Now, during my service on the commission from 2001 to 2012, I pressed for the adoption of an advocacy approach that links universalistic efforts with particular issues, and which addresses cases as well, and this has been a productive approach. The annual reports of the U.S. Commission indicate that. It was my privilege to serve on this commission and to learn from the other talented people serving on it, including Lincoln, Nebraska's own Preta Bonsall, who followed me as chair of the commission and brought legal rigor to the assessment of conditions and the application of standards. There were clergy of many kinds on this commission as well, bishops and archbishops, imams and pastors, but there were lay experts, foreign policy specialists, and there was even room for a human rights specialist and women's rights advocate like myself. Now, the State Department has produced more than a dozen of these reports, which have been described as grim reading about the status of religious freedom. Yet only about a dozen countries have merited designation in that list I told you about as the countries of particular concern systematic violators. They included Burma, China, Iran, Iraq, and Sudan in the first group that was named in 1999, along with Serbia and the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, not countries, but they were called severe violators, as they were not recognized countries. <clears throat> now, North Korea was added in 2001, Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, and Vietnam in 2004, and Uzbekistan in 2006. All those new ones came about because of the recommendations of the U.S. Commission. Serbia, the Taliban, Iraq, and Vietnam have been dropped from this list over the years for a variety of reasons. For most of these CPC-designated countries, the president is required to take an action but most of these countries already had sanctions against them. So as a matter of policy, this became a way for our presidents to avoid taking action against these very states that the Congress wanted them to take action against. Serbia, the Taliban, and Iraq were dropped after US-led invasions. Vietnam was dropped from the list in November 2006 and is the only country where actual diplomacy, r rather than the entry of US troops, had a role in the decision to eliminate CPC status. There was a binding agreement with Vietnam. It had some, we'll call them low standards, and uh, the country met them. The problems there continue. Since the Earth Act was adopted, the US government has paid more attention it's unquestionable. It's paid more attention to human rights violations committed against members of religious minorities and hotspots throughout the world. But implementing this policy has encountered both resistance and sometimes assistance from traditional diplomats, foreign governments, and uh, representatives of non-governmental organizations. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has explained the resistance as one of training she said it reflected a post-World War II approach. And I'll quote, she says, we were taught that religion was above and beyond reason. It evoked the deepest passions. And historically, it was the cause of much bloodshed. Diplomats in my era, she said, were taught not to invite trouble. And no subject seemed more inherently treacherous than religion. And in her book, which is entitled The Mighty and the Almighty, Secretary Albright went on to acknowledge that she and others were wrong. Billions of people still live under governments that fail to recognize or protect basic human rights. And 
religious freedom is an important one of them that needs more attention. Now, some commentators have complained that freedom of religion has become less important since the International Religious Freedom Act was adopted. They feel it was reduced to just one element in a overall scheme of human rights protection. Others complain that it's become too important in the overall scheme of protection. They argue that the US legislation elevates freedom of religion, so much so that it requires worldwide scrutiny and reporting, naming names of worst violators and taking actions against them. A whole industry has been built up, they complain. Well, I would argue that wherever you classify freedom of religion on the rights chart, few would deny that repression of religious freedom continues in many parts of the world. And it's a real problem. There has been a rebirth of concern over religious freedom issues, not only in the countries that emerged from the former Soviet Union, but those affected by the Arab uprising more recently and elsewhere throughout the world. The September 11, the 9-11 attacks have brought the linkage of religion to extremist violence into sharper focus. And it's increasingly acknowledged that global discord over religion has an impact on security and stability as well as on freedoms, including other freedoms worldwide. Now, I would also argue that freedom of religion needs more refined attention by the United States and more strategy needs to be developed on this subject and it needs to be fine-tuned to differing circumstances and we need new policies to integrate it into policy at the State Department and across the government. Existing international human rights instruments and implementation mechanisms may help point the way, but resolving the social, political, and cultural problems concerning freedom of religion worldwide require much more than a few rules and a few experts in Geneva or Washington. Canada, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and the European Union are adding to their toolkits to address these issues through international diplomacy. According to the Virginia-based First Freedom Center and its annual report on religious minorities, there are seven religious minorities that are at most at risk of disappearing altogether from the face of the earth by 2020, in another seven years. The list includes the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople, that is the Greek Orthodox Church in Turkey, Jehovah's Witnesses in Eritrea, Jews in the Arab world, and notably Tunisia, Iraq, and Egypt, the Muslim Masalit from Sudan, Nazarene Christians in Somalia, Sabean Mandeans from Iraq, and Jews of Venezuela. Now, these seven communities have not always suffered physical violence, although that is often a part of the picture. A little violence goes a long way as a warning of what is to come if the members of the community remain in place. One need only look at the Greek Orthodox Church in Turkey to see how an array of small bureaucratic measures, restrictions, confiscations, and pressure have reduced the community to little more than 1,000 people today in Turkey and have prevented its revival, its teaching, its, its, maybe its survival altogether within the country. Some countries use authoritarian measures to try to control all religion. And I saw this vividly uh, in, in the uh, USERF visit to China. Unfortunately, this continues today. Now, what are the violations directed against these religious minorities? Well, uh, it's the deed, not the creed. So let's look at what those deeds have been. The UN Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom, who investigates this issue on a daily basis and handles complaints um, from all over the world, has identified the following human rights violations against persons belonging to religious minorities. First, disproportionate bureaucratic restrictions. These could be registration requirements that are impossible to meet. This could be uh, refusing to allow the construction of houses of worship. Uh, 
or their repair. Uh, he said the denial, a second item is the denial of the appropriate legal status positions needed to build up or, up, or uphold a religious infrastructure. The, the legal status so you can build a church, so that you can have a school, open a school, so that you can train your own clergy or your um, uh, constituents. A thir another area is systematic discrimination and exclusion from par or important parts of society. For example, education, housing, health care, or participation in the police or medical field. I spoke earlier about the repression of the Baha'i in Iran, and it's exactly those areas that they can't receive uh, assistance in because they're not a recognized uh, religion. They are systematically discriminated against in Iran in, those, in all those ways. There are discriminatory rules within family laws that uh, hinder uh, the religious minorities. There is indoctrination of children from minorities in the public schools that has been complained about by different communities worldwide. Publicly stoked prejudices and vilifications sometimes associated with historical traumas of the past. That too has been noted by the United Nations Special Rapporteur. And there's more. Acts of vandalism and desecration. One need only look at France, Egypt, Norway. Uh, to see this uh, happening more and more often. Uh, the prohibition or disruption of religious ceremonies while they're taking place. Look at China. Threats and acts of violence. The Ahmadi community in Indonesia, the Shia in Pakistan. Uh, interference in the community's internal affairs. I've just given you an example from Turkey and there's so many others confiscation of community property, criminal sanctions, laws, special laws are created, like blasphemy laws or apostasy laws or proselytizing laws, uh, anti-proselytizing laws, which keep people from uh, being able to express their faith, share their faith, uh, and uh, they end up uh, in jail. Uh, and um, these are not elements which result from uncontrolled violence. These uh, each one seems to be calculated and a specific form of pressure and denial of religious freedom. And that's why each one can be addressed through a human rights approach, as I stated at the outset and we'll talk about a little bit more. Now, after you've heard about these incidents, the violations, the trends that I've outlined that have put minority members of minority religious communities at risk, the obvious question that arises is why? What provokes intolerance? What sustains it? And how does violence come into this picture? What can bring this behavior to an end and prevent its recurrence? In examining violence, discrimination, and other abuses associated with conflicts among minority religious communities, a human rights uh, approach to these incidents offers a structured conceptual approach. It mandates looking at certain issues and taking certain actions, establishing legal norms, creating a system to enforce the norms, and measures that can be taken to correct the practices that result in violations and that can prevent their recurrence. It helps us identify the items that are not being conducted. This kind of human rights approach brings us to the subject of accountability, identifying those who are responsible for breaching international norms and national laws, including the use of violence against other members of a religious community. And if they are proven responsible in a fair proceeding, it means ensuring the perpetrators are punished appropriately. Now, if you look at the interreligious and communal violence that has plagued so many countries in the last years, it becomes clear that an effective human rights approach has been absent. There may be lip service to human rights norms, but there is no effective enforcement of these norms. Instead, there is too often impunity for abuses. The culprits face no sanction. They face no punishment. Instead of investigating, 
and prosecuting, the authorities hold something called reconciliation meetings. And they use conflict resolution programs called healing methodologies. Now, these approaches have a role to play as part of a broader policy. But these scenarios routinely downplay and bypass human rights, and that needs to be changed. Two examples in recent years merit our attention. I'm going to talk a little bit about Egypt and about Nigeria. At the beginning of 2011, the world expressed shock over the suicide bombing against Orthodox Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, and about 20 people who died. At the beginning of 2012, there were bombings in other churches. Uh, and in northern Nigeria, we've seen it again and again. There, we're told that more than 14,000 people have been killed in these violent attacks, these religious attacks in Nigeria, Christians and Muslims, and it's uh, been some of each. The loss of life in Egypt and Nigeria may have been denounced by the government leadership, but the culprits surely felt that they risked nothing by committing such acts. In both Egypt and Nigeria, as in many other places around the globe, incidents of mass violence and communal killing are treated more as problems to be discussed than as crimes to be investigated and prosecuted and for which perpetrators are to be punished. It's almost as if these were natural disasters like flood or fire. Egypt holds reconciliation meetings among the residents in affected communities has only very rarely brought people to trial for such loss of life. Egypt has seen about 100 deaths in such violent uh, incidents uh, since, the since the revolution. More people killed in these sectarian clashes than in the 10 years prior to that. And it's been continuing. The problem is more severe in Nigeria. I cited the figure of 14,000 already. Rather than prosecuting those responsible, the Nigerian leaders counsel calm. Uh, they temporarily detain the suspects, and then they release them without charges. More than 800 people killed in April 2011. No one held. Christian Association of Nigeria reported that more than 430 churches were burned or destroyed. This impunity did not develop overnight. It's been occurring for years. And, it, and it's there is a context and a culture of impunity which reflects not just incapacity or lack of will on the part of the police to investigate and of the government to prosecute, but a lack of respect for human rights, a lack of respect for the individuals that are involved. Now, as any scholar of politics knows, inaction is not merely a failure to act. It is and often can be a deliberate action. Impunity does not result from incapacity or inability. There is often a lack of will on the part of the government and a willful decision not to investigate or pursue those responsible for religious freedom violations. The International Religious Freedom Act is concerned with state repression and also with state inability to control intercommunal violence. The failure to prevent and prosecute such violence and discrimination is something that has to be addressed and they, are, they recognize that in uh, the State Department annual reports. I spoke about those reports earlier. In the most recent such report, they said, many states that have laws guaranteeing religious freedom fall short in protecting minorities by failing to take steps to curb intolerance, attacks, and harassment. And this impunity can exacerbate sectarian violence and empower those who attack religious minorities. 
so we know what the problem is. This kind of impunity is widespread, and it's not just limited to the two cases I, I went into in a little bit of detail. It happens worldwide. The State Department report says there's official impunity of police and government officials in Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, and Burkina Faso, and other countries in Africa. The UN Committee Against Torture has identified three factors that combine to promote impunity for those who carry out repressive measures against members of religious minorities in China, such as the Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners, and unofficial uh, communities. First, there's a law on state secrets, which keeps the number of practitioners and adherents to each of these communities a secret. And then there is reported harassment of the lawyers and human rights defenders, something we saw quite vividly last year in the case of the blind lawyer, Chen Guangchen, who fled to the American embassy. Uh, and third, according to the UN committee, there are, and I quote, abuses carried out by unaccountable thugs who use physical violence against specific defenders but enjoy de facto immunity, unquote. Collectively, these problems stand in the way of ensuring that on the books, legal safeguards protect members of religious communities and minorities from repression. And this is yet another form of impunity. Now, impunity uh, has been identified as a problem in Russia, where hate crimes, including vandalism, anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic incidents are often dismissed simply as hooliganism. And it's perpetrated by private actors. Therefore, the government doesn't consider it to be a human rights abuse. Now that brings me back to my earlier point, which it's not hooliganism, it's human rights abuse. It has to be taken seriously. The State Department has acknowledged that in, in Russia, authorities rarely prosecuted or sentenced those arrested for attacks and vandalism against religious minorities, and often failed even to bring charges against those when religious bigotry was clearly involved. Hungary, member of the European Union, the police closed investigations in 136 cases of vandalism or burglary in Jewish or Christian cemeteries. Moldova, former Soviet Union. Jehovah's Witnesses reported, this is the State Department's findings, reported they were frequently treated aggressively and occasionally physically attacked. They filed reports with the police, but those responsible have not been punished. The US report spoke differently regarding India. And it's worth quoting. They said some state and local governments limited a freedom by not efficiently or effectively prosecuting those who attacked religious minorities. But the government of India provides minorities strong official legal protection, although at times it's weak law enforcement, lack of trained police, and overburdened court system played a role in addressing communal tensions as quickly as possible. Now, many actions are described in this State Department's annual report. Uh, they've concluded that taken together, lengthy procedures and acquittals don't add up to impunity in, uh, when a substantial number of cases end in convictions. So they felt that, for example, in the uh, aftermath of the riots in Orissa in India, substantial restitution is provided to victims, fast track courts have functioned, this is not impunity. But in other cases, time and time again, they identify this impunity. United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva has identified 92 countries about which impunity has been raised by one or more treaty monitoring bodies. 28 of them in Africa, 21 in Eastern Europe, 19 in Latin America, 15 in Asia, nine in West European and other countries. It's a worldwide problem when it comes to attacks on religious minorities. Now, uh, a human rights approach will help us pinpoint and move forward and see that there is accountability. Another example of uh, harassment of religious minorities 
is to consider the problem of anti-Semitism worldwide. It morphs with the times, it changes, and how does one address it? It's not always directed against people, though violence is reported to be growing in intensity. The United States has a special envoy on anti-Semitism. Uh, actually, uh, the current envoy has just um, returned to private life, Hannah Rosenthal, and she said, there are a number of trends that are going on, but her quotable quote was that anti-Semitism is not history, it's news. And she described reports by the governments of Norway, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom, all of which reveal an increase in anti-Semitism in those countries. She described desecrations of Holocaust memorials, synagogues, Jewish cemeteries in Croatia, Czech Republic, Greece, Lithuania, and Poland, accusations of blood libels, that Jews kill, uh, ancient blood uh, libels that Jews allegedly killed children uh, to use their blood for rituals or kidnapped children to steal their organs coming, coming forth uh, in European newspapers. And, and even in the parliament in Hungary and in Sweden, anti-Semitic incidents included threats, verbal abuse, vandalism, and graffiti and harassment in schools of school children. The situation in Sweden, in the town of Malmo, she said, was acute. The rabbi of Malmo has been assaulted, physically assaulted, almost two dozen times in the past two years. The Swedish government has provided security for the community, but the community doesn't feel that it's very successful. Now, what can be done? Well, our U.S. envoy says that long-term education and action to rebut inappropriate language by individual leaders is the way to go, not punishment. It's my view that education and understanding only takes us so far. They're useful, but more needs to be done. Indifference is not an answer. As Elie Wiesel has stated time and again, indifference always helps the perpetrator, never the victim. I'd like to offer some examples of advocacy uh, that I've engaged in uh, that are perhaps models for the future, for addressing the challenges directed against religious minorities. They draw upon a blend of particularism, universalism, and realism, and build on the experience of uh, Jewish advocacy for freedom of religion and related human rights. Uh, these have been anchored in and directly influenced by universal elements in Judaism that value all human life and call for equality before the law. The specific mixture of these elements in advocacy by Jewish organizations and individuals that I have uh, worked with has also reflected a sense of what's possible, a realism about how to achieve idealistic goals of religious freedom and related human rights. Now, after two millennia of persecutions, expulsions, and discrimination of the kind I spoke of earlier, the universalistic approach after the Holocaust is perhaps a surprising focus for Jewish advocacy. But Jewish leaders argued that religious rights and physical security of Jews can only be preserved if the human rights of all persons are secure. And this universalism has certainly guided the advocacy techniques of the Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights, which I direct at the American Jewish Committee and other organizations active in this uh, field. Uh, there's no better guide for action here than the uh, famous uh, saying uh, of uh, Rabbi Hillel, who proclaimed, if I am not for myself, then who will be? If I am only for myself, then what am I? And if not now, when? These questions address particularism, universalism, and realism. Now, making a difference in this world in addressing adversity encourages advocates to link these universal efforts with particular cases. I press this as an advocacy aim also in the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. We use the acronym USERF, U-S-C-I-R-F, uh, to describe it. Well, USERF's advocacy efforts included press releases for visibility, congressional actions establishing linkage and sanctions, and direct travel to countries concerned to protect harassed persons. 
We focused on individuals. It might be Christians in Sudan, Baha'is and Jews in Iran, Buddhists in China and Vietnam, Muslim prisoners in Saudi Arabian jails, and more. We pressed for new provisions and constitutions that would ensure all elements of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 18 of the Civil Political Covenant are guaranteed. And as Commission Chair, I also advanced efforts to establish new institutions to promote scrutiny and propose solutions country by country. Specifically, and alongside a focus on the creation of a special representative on combating anti-Semitism at the European Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, another part of the architecture I spoke about before. I also advocated through USERF for the creation and support of similar experts to address discrimination against Muslims, to dis address xenophobia, racism, and abuses against Christians. My advocacy calling for the equal right of women to religious freedom to be taken account in the Commission's work stem from both particular and universal concerns. And we still have a long way to go on the issue of gender equality and religious freedom. Now, I'm going to share with you a few lessons from USERF advocacy uh, and, then, uh, and then conclude. As part of the interplay between the universal and the particular, there have to be realistic calculations. So you have to figure out what issues you're going to address you have to set goals and prioritize among them. You have to find angles for advocacy. You need to devise ways of communicating effectively, mobilizing core constituencies, and advocating with government and other leaders. In late 2011, actually late 2012, USERF's mandate was reauthorized for another three years. And some of its critics claim that in the future it should adopt an engagement or an interreligious approach rather than continuing to use a human rights approach. Now, what's needed is to assess severe violations accurately, to use consistent criteria, and to press to maintain universal standards. Interreligious dialogue is valuable as a long term educational device. But such reconciliation efforts reflect a conflict resolution approach, not a human rights approach. And that can be counterproductive, as I've described already. In contrast, the human rights approach measures action against the norms set out in international instruments and set out in the Religious Freedom Act itself. It prioritizes fact-finding, investigations, truth-telling, and putting objective facts about compliance and violations of standards into the public record and holding perpetrators accountable. A dialogue approach can often be used to justify slippery standards, sometimes even to accept a government's repression based on false equivalencies. Advocates need to challenge such tendencies. Many of the country visits I participated in as a commissioner to examine religious freedom conditions allowed me to implement this rights-based approach and to remind US and foreign governments of the importance of realism. A few examples. In Saudi Arabia, I asked the Minister of Religious Endowments, who's in charge of the holy mosques and all the imams in the country, I asked the Minister of Religious Endowments to eliminate teaching of the elements of the notorious anti-Semitic protocols of the elders of Zion in Saudi textbooks that were used in the kingdom and spread worldwide. He replied that he opposes anti-Semitism, but this book, the protocols of the elders of Zion, well, he said, and I quote, it has a long history here. My father even had a copy, unquote. I pointed out how Adolf Hitler and other anti-Semites had relied on it, had pointed to it, and how it incites hatred of Jews worldwide even today. He refused to budge. Lesson learned. Don't be afraid to push back. Learn your subject matter. Speak clearly about how incitement to violence is spread. Be sure your interlocutors understand that their actions have consequences at home and abroad and that you know it. Another example, in Uzbekistan, in the fabled Silk Road city of Samarkand, I recall meeting the local mayor, 
And we explained our concerns about reports of extensive repression against Muslims in Uzbekistan. And I noted how smoothly he turned to tell the very slick, leather-jacketed colleague sitting next to him who accompanied our group that he had better get over to the mosque and tell them how to answer these questions we weren't expecting. He spoke to him in Russian, thinking we didn't understand. Lesson learned. Officials everywhere will think that you can be fooled or that you are a fool. You can turn their arrogance into an asset by being informed. Read, learn as much as you can, and always bring your own translator on these trips. I had also the opportunity to go firsthand to a visit to examine religious freedom conditions in Egypt a few years back. And while we were there, we were meeting with a Coptic bishop to learn about the problems faced by this, the Middle East's largest uh, Christian community consists of 10% of, uh, of Egypt's population. The bishop was constantly interrupted by phone calls, and he ran off to an adjacent room and was mystified. He'd come back and continue mid-sentence wherever he was, and was irritated, and it kept going on. Six phone calls in the course of a one-hour meeting. I learned on leaving, only on leaving, that all six phone calls were from the Egyptian state security agents. They were demanding to know from him right then and there what we were doing, what we were asking about, why he hadn't informed them that we were coming and getting an earful in reply. Lesson learned. Assume that security officials are interested in religious leaders and human rights issues. And when you visit such countries, remember, you're never alone. Now, what conclusions do we draw from all of this? I conclude that much can be accomplished to advance protection of religious minorities and freedom of thought, conscience, and religion worldwide. We have to examine the toolkit we have. We have to examine the architecture, respond in new ways, use a human rights framework, focus on the individual, don't forget about it, and fix it. We need new strategies and ways to integrate them into policy. And meanwhile, each of us can do something to draw more attention to these needs. We need to do more by fighting for freedom, by building a rule of law and the institutions to enforce it. We need to do more by working to build national institutions to respect and implement law. We need to do much more to strengthen the non-governmental human rights movement worldwide. We need to figure out practical solutions where we can. And we certainly need to engage with global actors to, um, to enable them to demand concerted action to prevent and punish atrocities and genocide. And as Americans, world citizens, concerned persons, we need to speak truth to power and demand accountability for the actions that are taken against persons belonging to religious minorities. In sum, we can make a difference by understanding that universal rights are worth fighting for and demanding more from leadership here and now, whether it's from ourselves or from secular and religious leaders, from citizens, NGOs around the world, or from our own government. Now, President Obama, in his first inaugural address, spoke of human rights and freedom and said, Quote, those ideals still light the world, and we will not give them up for expediency's sake, unquote. Well, those issues are being tested today in all those hot spots around the world I mentioned at the outset. Mali, Burma, China, Iran, Pakistan, Sweden, Norway, Norway, and so many others. Human rights and religious freedom advocates overseas look to Americans for moral support, for legal analysis, for educational materials and other advocacy. You can also help them by supporting their work and speaking out, asking US officials to make these matters a higher priority in US policy. Remember that your voice matters. You can get involved, you can speak out, and you can recognize, as Eleanor Roosevelt pointed out, that 
and I quote, the destiny of human rights lies in the hands of all of our citizens in all of our communities, unquote. So that means you and me, and there's no better time to act than right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, uh, get a card from one of the ushers, uh, write your question as quickly as possible and give it back to the ushers so that they can be uh, brought over here and uh, brought to the front so that we can uh, ask them. Uh, let me begin with a question that comes from the uh, Thompson uh, Learning, uh, the Thompson Scholars Learning uh, Community, one of the students. Uh, obviously, the student was aware that uh, you have been involved uh, both through the United Nations and uh, in the United States on, on the U.S. Uh, Commission. Uh, if there are differences between the two, how do you reconcile that in terms of how you operate uh, both uh, in a U.N. and a U.S. context? Well, I've always advocated that universal standards have to be met. And actually, the International Religious Freedom Act has exactly the same approach. The International Religious Freedom Act does not set out American standards. It sets out universal standards. It refers to the universal instruments. And it says that this is what we're looking at. Uh, if, it's going to, if it's violated, that's what we have to address. We're asked that question wherever we go, all over the world, people say, well, you're just implementing US, you know, the US approach, which is different. And we explain to them, that's not the case at all. While I'm waiting for questions to come from, from the audience, let me uh, ask you, you know, which uh, countries would you put at the top of the list as the uh, countries that most abuse uh, religious freedom? Well, I mentioned some of them uh, that the State Department has identified, and I think that's not a bad list. Uh, China, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Iran, um, the uh, uh, Sudan, uh, um, uh, as well as um, Uzbekistan, and um, um, I had cited um, uh, today, the US hasn't cited uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan, uh, but I think today those would have to be a, a high on our list uh, of uh, severe abusers as well. Nigeria is another for the reasons I've described. Okay, uh, here's a question from, from the audience. Uh, is there impunity and lack of prosecution involved in the violation of human rights of Palestinians? Could you repeat the question? Uh, is there impunity and lack of prosecution involved in the violation of the human rights of Palestinians? Well, this is an issue which uh, has uh, evoked a lot of attention uh, uh, for example, of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, you'll remember uh, that uh, only a year or, or, or so ago, uh, Justice Goldstone, who had raised the question of impunity in his report, came uh, uh, to the uh, United Nations and the Washington Post and wrote and he said that, uh, that actually the, that what he had thought was impunity and a failure of the government to investigate was uh, uh, was no longer a relevant issue because the government does uh, respond in those issues in those cases but this is an ongoing but this is an ongoing problem in every country uh, and certainly uh, the courts uh, could do a better job do religious rights trump human rights, for example, uh, a religion that exercises abuse of women? This is another one. Uh, 
sometimes rights conflict. And the question is, does God's law trump man's law, or woman's law in this case? Uh, and the fact of the matter is that, that usually the circumstances have to be examined uh, and a balancing test has to be applied. But the universal instruments provide for that balancing test. They say no one has a right to destroy someone else's human rights. So the balancing test is you can't destroy my rights. My rights stop where your rights begin. And, and, and you have to put the two of them together. This question almost uh, is a wonderful one to, to follow on the last. Uh, do you see the rights of religious belief and practice extending to those without religion, such as atheists? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, in fact, the U.S. Commission even made a statement on this recently uh, in which they uh, uh, spoke about it. But uh, look at the, look at the uh, language. Look at the language. We're protecting freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief. Well, you could argue that uh, non-belief is a form of belief, or you could say that freedom of thought and conscience is the right to challenge religion and belief and, and, and otherwise. So, of course, the, the freedom of persons not to believe has to be ensured in order to ensure the right of all persons to believe. What do you say to those religions that use violence in religious practice? You know, um, it's the deed, not the creed. And violence against persons is criminalized in, I think, uh, every uh, country in the world. So if a religion uses violence in in its practice, it would be subject, one would assume it would be subject uh, to prosecution under national law. And this is true also, um, uh, you know, uh, slavery and um, bride burning and uh, issues of this sort have been criminalized by, by uh, governments around the world and condemned by people throughout the world. So. Um, sometimes um, uh, understanding uh, evolves, and uh, and uh, we have to we have to uh, remember to protect people, not to punish them. Since Eve teasing is common and unpunished in India, why has the recent rape of a woman on a bus caused much concern? Does this signal a change of the culture toward women in India? Well, this was a terrible, terrible uh, incident, and it mobilized people in a way that we haven't seen uh, in India. Let's hope that it mobilizes action by government officials and by the uh, population as a whole to, to stop uh, violence against women, to change the tolerance of such practices. Uh, they, again, they're criminalized throughout the world and they need to be not ignored, not forget about it. They need to be fixed. Please join with me in our final opportunity to thank you, uh, Felice Gare, for this evening. <laughs>